Hi, this is Steve, and welcome to another episode of Tech Leader Talk. This interview is part of the Space Tech Innovation Event, where space tech leaders share the latest trends and key insights that you can use to grow any tech company. The event is free, and you can register at spacetechinnovation.com, where you get access to all the audios, videos, edited transcripts, and an executive summary for each interview. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Maureen Haverty, who's the Investment Vice President at Seraphim Space. Seraphim Space invests in space tech startups from seed investments through their full life cycle. Maureen joined Seraphim Space after a successful career as the Chief Operating Officer at Apollo Fusion and the Senior Director of Corporate Development at Astra. And during our interview, Maureen talks about what she and the other team members at Seraphim Space look for when they're analyzing space tech companies for investment and how that differs sometimes from analyzing non-space tech companies. She also talks about what Seraphim Space likes to see in the company's leadership team. And she provides some suggestions on what a space tech startup should be looking for in an investor. So Maureen also shares some thoughts on what she expects uh, we're going to see with space tech funding and those trends in the coming year. So I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with Maureen and you get some insights on how to get potentially funding for your own company. So let's get to my discussion with Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Hey. So I gave the audience a little bit of an introduction uh, kind of with your background, but tell us a little bit, especially with respect to the work you're doing in the space industry now, how did you get there? Is this, was this a childhood dream? Is this something that developed over time? Tell us a little bit about your journey. Uh, I ended up in space completely accidentally. So I actually did, um, I, I started out doing a civil engineering degree in Ireland and um, didn't like that. So I um, moved into nuclear engineering. Uh, I did a PhD in nuclear engineering in uh, Manchester, the University of Manchester in the UK, um, and then stayed working in the UK at the National Nuclear Lab there as a mm -hmm. researcher for a couple of years. Um, and then I got the opportunity to move out to California and I joined a startup working on a nuclear power device we didn't call it a reactor it was a nuclear fusion core with a nuclear fission blanket um mm, I'm a nuclear fission engineer um and i started working on the design of that blanket um the idea of that was is that the fusion core would produce neutrons but we weren't going to hit break even we'd use a fission blanket to multiply the neutrons and we would generate enough energy that way so um it was all going great and we were going to roll it out internationally and it was all very exciting, but we needed to hit uh, certain metrics on the fusion core and we weren't going to hit that before we ran out of our funding. Oh. So we decided to pivot to space. Um, we decided on a Friday and came back into work on a Monday to take the fusion core, <laughs> pivot to space. It, uh, it had originally used some Hall effect thrusters or so some space technology and we moved it back into space. Uh, this is back in 2017 when, you know, SpaceX Starlink was really, you know, getting going and getting yeah. ready to launch. And there was one web and we we're like, space is really hot right now. This is the perfect time. And, you know, we, we pivoted into space. So I'm a complete accidental space industry person. Um, and then over time I moved out of, you know, just working on technical work and started doing some of the business stuff. Um, in Apollo Fusion, um, eventually became COO. And then um, we were acquired by Astra, the rocket launch company, for about mm -hmm. uh, for $145 million. So it was a pretty good exit for a space hardware company yeah. in 2021. Uh, stayed working at Astra for about a year in corporate development and now have moved into venture capital at Seraphim Space in London. Okay. <clears throat> so now you get to take a lot of that knowledge in your background and help it with both the analysis and I suppose guiding the, some of the companies that you invest in. Yeah, it's great. I mean, yeah, I do feel I've kind of got a, a, 
a, a secret advantage um, because I do know the space industry pretty well. Um, I can definitely tell if, you know, all oh, that constellation is going to go ahead or not. Um, and then, you know, yeah, some of the, I know the challenges that people will face. Um, so hopefully that helps with investing decisions. Um, but then also there's a, a portfolio management aspect to the job as well. So after we make the investment, we obviously want to make sure a company succeeds. So yeah. I'm a board observer on two of our portfolio companies um, okay. and we work with portfolio companies long-term as well. Okay. That, does, that sounds interesting. You get to see the cutting edge things. <clears throat> what uh, There's a lot going on in the space world right now. We we're talking a little before the interview, uh, before we started the recording, you know, I'm old enough to have watched the Apollo launches and then things were kind of slow. It was, it was NASA as far as the United States. Now it's, it, it's crazy. The number of uh, private companies there are, and just and so many different developments and so many different projects and, and big visions. What's most exciting to you about what's going on in the space industry today? Yeah, I think I think you're totally right. Um, I think 2022 certainly was, I think, the year where space is kind of in the public consciousness mm -hmm. more than probably at any time since the moon landings. Um, and I think a few things have happened with that. I think Actually, I think James Webb was was pretty inspirational to a lot yeah. of ordinary people, again, which is great. And then I think the war in Ukraine really reminded people that actually space is affecting every aspect of your life on a daily basis. And it's just totally critical to intelligence, to communications, to location um, mapping, which, which, you know, industry experts know that all the time. But I don't think an ordinary person really knew that until they were seeing the images um, and the news every day. So I think that's what happened in 2022 um, is all of, the, all of the commercial bubbling kind of activity that's been coming along, obviously with SpaceX, with Starlink's constellation. I think it's just really the ordinary person on the street really understands that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the change I think that's happened um, in terms of what I'm finding really exciting for for this year is I kind of think there's a new I'm going to call it you know a, a cell phone manufacturer arms race going on you know Apple announced its um its emergency beacon feature right. uh, last year and I mean everyone else has to keep up you know you cannot afford to let Apple uh beat you there and in fact because they came out first you have to beat them in the next uh rollout of your technology so um, Apple is providing that emergency beacon feature by communicating directly with satellites with Global Star's constellation and a new constellation from Global Star. So I think all those other satellite manufacturers and the chipset manufacturers that deliver for those, uh, you know, uh, companies uh, need to find a way to talk to satellites. And I think there's a huge number of companies that are taking different ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. yeah. So that's the that's the really thing that's really exciting for me right now. That's an interesting feature to be able to do that. And I'm sure the functionality of it, instead of just an emergency beacon type thing, it'll be expanded. And I guess that displaces uh, maybe the, some of the current satellite phone manufacturers, <laughs> just like I our think, phones displace the GPS uh, devices. Yeah, I think the emergency beacon feature is just the first step. I mm -hmm. think it's going to be, you know, I think it's going to be texting um, to satellites pretty soon. And I think that's really enabling for... Um, for a lot of places and a lot of things. So, mm -hmm. so, so there's different <clears throat> types of technologies. We we're just talking about satellites, but a lot of different types of technologies and robotics and things that go on with the space industry. Are there particular areas that, that you and that Sarah from Space focus on for their investments, or are you kind of across the whole spectrum? Yeah. So, um, just very briefly about Sarah from Space. So, we're a space specialist uh, venture capital fund. Mm -hmm. So we. Um, so we invest just in space, but we have a reasonably broad definition of space. So that's everything okay. that's going to space, in space, supporting something in space, ground communications to talk to your satellites. But then anything, and this is a growing area for us and for the industry, anything that uses space data and builds okay. a product around that. So examples of that would be someone's using uh, Earth observation data from satellites, um, and they're using that to make better uh, wildfire models, and they're using that to be a better insurer for wildfires yeah. um, or 
or climate companies who are looking at deforestation or carbon credits uh, monitoring um, or precision out agriculture. So these are big growth areas for us. Um, we have, we're listed on the London Stock Exchange. Um, it's kind of a fairly unique model um, um, in available in the UK. Um, we do venture investments from everything from seed up to pre-IPO. And then we have an accelerator where we use that to support particularly pre-seed companies as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. What do you yourself then, do you kind of work across that whole spectrum or do you rely some on your nuclear engineering background and 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 support those related companies? Uh, yes, so I, um, I'm i on the investment team, I'm an investor. So I'm not, you know, I support the accelerator team, but that's not my day-to-day -day job. So okay. I'm looking for investments from seed up to that pre-IPO. Okay. Um, so I, I do that investing and... I mean, you know, no, no one in the company officially has a, you know, a, a further specialism, you know, space is specialized enough and you can work and would feel comfortable to work on any investments. But in terms of you see a company and you like it and you get on with the founder, I think, you know, everyone has, you know, particular subsectors that they're really excited about. As I said, yeah. I'm super excited by satellite to sell i've got one uh colleague who's just really excited by carbon credits um so you have you you have sectors where you're like i love this this is such an important thing i'm gonna go out and find a company in this but also you just have you know yes i like the dtech uh startup ceos definitely <laughs> okay so what for the listeners who are e either in a, a non-space tech company but but could be moving into that area or are in space companies now and looking at at funding what do you look for what are some of the key factors that you're looking for you know at some of the earlier rounds at either seed or or even up to series a um so we focus quite a bit on tech as in do you have you know a, a technology moat in whatever you're working on that's definitely something we look at you don't mm -hmm. have to have it but it's something that we definitely look at i mean at seed and early stage probably the most important thing is the team um, because you probably haven't done that much yet or you only have very early stage proof. Mm -hmm. So I think of it like you're doing something very difficult that other people have probably tried to do before and failed or, mm -hmm. you know, are competing against other people who are trying to do the same thing. Why do, you, why do I think that you're the team that's going to be able to do this? So we are, really dig into that with founders that you've you've made some bold promises why do i think you can deliver so that's definitely something mm -hmm. the biggest thing that kills um you know an investment for us or you know as in like oh this is a great company it's a great team why don't i invest in as a venture capitalist is basically i don't think i'm going to achieve the returns that i have promised to my own investors because I don't think you can scale to be a large enough company. And that's, you know, and that's probably the biggest thing for space companies is that their market isn't large enough. They can't generate enough revenue to deliver venture scale returns. And, and that's that's very challenging telling startup CEOs that because I'm not telling you you have a bad company. I'm not telling you you're not going to be wildly rich and successful yourself, but you just are probably not going to be a multi-billion dollar company, which is what I'm looking for. It's what you need to get the returns or to get it's the, what I, the multiples. Yeah, it's, yeah. Broadly speaking, yeah, it's what we need to get the returns. And, you know, okay. some huge growth investors, they need you to be a $10 billion company. And, you know, they can't invest in you if that's not going to be the case. Okay. So uh, I, I've talked with VCs in, in the tech world in general that, that are not necessarily investing in space. And a lot of the timeframes they're dealing with are shorter than what it takes to develop, test, launch, especially if it's a, some kind of a launch vehicle or something going to the moon. How does that affect your impact, your analysis when, well, first of all, the amount of money up front can be huge. You can't just prototype this and launch it in your garage. And if the runway, if the time to get that first product done is is years down the road, how, how do you manage that kind of from an investor standpoint? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And that comes back to the fact that we're listed on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, so most venture funds are taking, you know, they're, they're private funds and they've got a 10 to 12 year lifespan, which means they, you know, they're trying to return money to investors within mm -hmm. 12 years. They have a life fund. Um, and that obviously, as you said, you know, 
it, I'm not going to get my money back on time, so I can't invest in you. Um, so we we appreciate that that's very challenging in space and deep tech more broadly. So we take advantage of fa- the fact that we can be an investment trust on the London Stock Exchange. So basically what happens is, is the original investors put money in, um, we invest it, and then because it's a publicly listed uh, trust, uh, the net asset value of you know the, the the net asset value of the underlying portfolio companies goes up, um, and as a result, the share price should go up, and then investors make their money by selling the shares. And if people want access to you know that underlying basket of companies, they buy the shares. So that okay. you know we're not forcing an exit. Um, we're not, we're not forcing an exit. Now, that's all well and good, um, but obviously you don't want to really drive down your returns by having something that's 15 years away from revenue. So you do, it's not like you get you get forever, but you get take some of that pressure off because as long as you're hitting your milestones and market's developing, you're starting to generate revenue, you might be more than seven years away from an exit, but your value, your company valuation has gone up over time. Okay. All right, all right. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, different. That's a little different model than... Other yeah. people I've talked it's, with. It's quite, it's quite common in it's. I, I believe it's more or less unique to the London Stock Exchange. So it's quite common in the UK. Okay. Um, but the great thing is, is that we can invest internationally. So just because we're doing that in the UK, um, we we can still invest globally. In fact, the whole companies. world. Okay, hmm. yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. That's clever. <laughs> what you talked a little bit earlier about what what you look for in companies and things. As far as the leaders themselves or the leadership team, what kind of are you looking for certain experience and history that they've got in the space industry, or what are the big things that you want to see across the team? Um, so I I personally would probably not like to be too prescriptive of oh, they've come from a big company or they haven't or whatever, but essentially across the leadership team and however they work that out between the co-founders, we obviously want business savvy. If they're trying to do something very technically challenging, uh, you know, why can this CTO, why, like what technology, what savviness are they bringing in? Um, But again, something that probably holds back a lot of companies in the deep tech, tech, deep tech sector. And, and then in space is it may be very academic uh, co-founders, two very academic co-founders um, who really don't understand business at all, don't know how to find a customer, don't know how to work out what the right product is, don't know how to lead a team in this kind of in a startup environment. So we really like to see that that is there in some way, shape or form. Um, nice to have if you're selling to the government. It's great if you've got some experience from the government. Um, but again, you know, that can be within the company. It doesn't have to be in the leadership team. Um, and, you know, people like SpaceX founders because they're fast and they get things done. And, you know, that's good. You just need to have kind of that entrepreneurial drive in the team. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's interesting. What's, to kind of flip the question, you talked about what you look for in a uh, in a company to invest in. If I'm a, a, a space tech co-founder uh, or on the leadership team, what do I need to be thinking about? when I'm analyzing the investments, uh, different investment opportunities? Yeah. Um, I it, It's really hard. And I think it's probably, there's some things that have happened during 2022 that have probably changed some of you know my thinking on this. So I definitely don't think you need in space, just space specialist VCs. I mean, Obviously, I think having some is great. And if you're a great company, I definitely want to invest in you. So obviously there's an, a self-serving element yeah. there. Why, why do you want some space specialist species network? Um, uh, the credibility it gives you um, when you bring in general species who are like, I don't know space. I know this is a great team, et cetera. But, you know, ideally we think that the Seraph and brand name um, people know that we know what we're talking about and that helps bring in other investors. Okay. And we have found that with portfolio companies and that is a part of the reason that people come to us. Um, the ability of um, investors to follow on. So do they have enough funding available 
to follow on in your next rounds. So that's really important. Yeah. That's important for two things, two reasons. You know, you, you know, you want to be able to like ease, you know, make your next investment round easier. But then one thing that investors look at is are the existing investors following on? Are they participating? Because if they're not, that can imply that they've lost confidence in the company. So it's, it right. can be a negative signal. Um, I think one thing that's really come up this year is um, the how strong your investor syndicate is. So that part of that be ability to follow on and have enough funding is if you have a very weak syndicate coming in, as in you've got a lot of existing investors that can't really supply a lot of funding mm -hmm. in, the in this round or in the future, that will put off some stronger, higher caliber investors because they know like, well, we're just going to be left carrying the can and yeah. we're going to have to pay more money. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's definitely um, come up quite a bit. Um, one that's really common in space, and it's just, it's not say to say don't do it, but just to be thoughtful about it is um, corporate investors. So let's say a big space prime um, investing in you what does that actually mean in practice? And there are concerns um, from general and generalist investors that whether well, they're not returns driven. So the fact they're involved doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be a venture scale investment. Okay. Uh, that's one thing that you might be worried about. Second thing is if you have them on your board, they know a lot about the company and they know if you're distressed and sometimes they might swoop in and buy you cheaply. And other investors don't like that. They know that that can happen. Um, so there are two things to think about. But on the other hand, if they really are bringing a lot of business development opportunities, they're bringing a lot of credibility, that can, you know, they can be great. So it's just thoughtful management of that. Okay. <clears throat> it's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, that last one there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Buy them out and then that kind of disrupts the whole relationship with the other investors. It's and just the founders. <laughs> It's something that, you know, the other investors who are totally returns driven can be just really, you know, worried about and they can worry that, you know, corporate investors will hold back funding that they definitely have to, you know, put a company into a state of right. stress. It shouldn't happen, but it's a worry and, you know. Sure. Yeah. Understood. So it would be an understatement to say that there's been a lot of changes in the venture capital world in the last year or two. How has that impacted the way Seraphim Space operates? Is it changing your analysis? Um, I, I'm sure, and you're kind of in an interesting situation between the companies being invested in, and then the on the opposite side, you have to be talking to your investors who are investing into the funds. How has that all changed in the last year or two? Yeah, so so just we we do a space index, which is kind of a quarterly roundup of investments. Um, and the twenty the Q four twenty twenty two one basically covers the whole year, so um, that's available on our website um, and could be interesting to look at. But broadly speaking, what's changed and what has not changed? So what has not changed is is that um, the vast majority of growth investment, so you know, kind of Series B plus, it's still in the US um, in the space sector. It's something like sixty percent is going to US companies. Oh, okay. And, you know, mostly from U.S. investors. So that's that's something that hasn't changed. Uh, positive changes are um, seed investment is way up. And actually, the median <laughs> investment into seed is, is up 50%. So it's up from a million dollars to $1.5 million. Series okay. A, still the same as 2021. At $10 million is the typical um, investment it's at the growth stage, it really just starts to drop off. The valuations are way down and the uh, investments are way down. And what has driven that is that because the valuations are down, because you know, growth investors are now like, you have to have revenue. If you didn't have to raise, you you wouldn't. Um, so there are a lot of companies are holding debt off until 2023. Um that's the first thing. And the second thing is, is that you have these invest, you know, people don't want to take this a down round, uh, a reduced yeah. valuation. So they're just brought, um, taking bridge financing. So a, a carry me over financing from internal investors who aren't, you know, repricing the company. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that means you're taking, you know, 
no one wants to give you a new $100 million investment if they're not pricing it. So you're taking the bare minimum. The investors are giving you the bare minimum. So that's, they're the kind of, you know, the changes that we have seen. Um, and, you know, there's no, there's no real mega rounds um, in 2022. Um, so, you know, no billion dollar plus rounds except for SpaceX. So they're, they're, that's, that's the background that we're dealing with. So how does that change how we look at investments? Okay, so I said investor syndicate is um, is definitely something that investors are thinking about more because those who have funding are like, oh, I've, I've already with two or three portfolio companies this year, I've been left carrying the can. I'm going to be really thoughtful about who I invest in from now on to avoid this happening. So again, when bad things happen, people are reminded I should be thinking about this all the time. Second thing is, I think our terms are less favorable to startups people are much more concerned about being diluted people are much more concerned about um, making their money back if the company goes into bankruptcy or is acquired for a very low valuation so uh definitely seen some startup founders complaining about that um i mean unfortunately it's like (laughs) when you're getting a mortgage in an unfavorable economic environment, interest rates are high. The terms are not going to be as nice. Um, That's just the nature of you're taking money from someone. Um, So there are two things I think that, that startup founders probably are feeling the pinch on a lot. Um, What are other things that we think about? I mean, all, you know, the growth investors are just like, if you don't have revenue, um, don't, I'm not going to talk to you at all. Um, so that's another thing that people are saying. Um, how are we discussing, but broadly speaking, generally across all industries, there's something like $300 billion of venture capital dry powder available mm-hmm. to invest. So there's money there to invest. Probably some investors are waiting for evaluations to come down a bit more. Okay. Um, and how are VCs communicating with their investors i would say it's probably more challenging for everyone to raise around right now i think the only vcs that are finding it very easy to raise are um climate where the valuations have been sky high in 2022 okay interesting so what do you see coming for the rest of 2023 and maybe into next year what what are your guesses yeah they're, they're like yeah i think that's a great caveat. Yeah. these are basically guesses um um so uh i mentioned that all these companies have been doing bridge financing in 2022 if you raised a big a really big round at the end of 2021 um which a lot of people did um you will probably almost certainly need to go out and raise meaningful amounts of money in 2023 you usually only raise for 18 to 24 months yeah. and so i think we're going to see some large raises i think Hopefully those companies have taken the time to get their house in order in 2022 and then going out and raising meaningful amounts of money in uh, 2023. So uh, possibly an increase in some of the later stage um, round sizes. So that's the first thing. Uh, We saw a really big increase in um, seed stage funding in Asia and in Europe um, so 50% up in Europe, 80% up in Asia. And that means, uh, yeah, which is, which is really surprising and really exciting. And what that means is that way more, um, way more investment grade startups were, were founded in 2022 than ever before. So it's uh, very interesting, I think, to see, will that trend continue in 2023? Probably. Um, but also over the next few years, how those companies are going to raise big growth rounds uh, because, as I said, the vast majority of it is still going to U.S. companies. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. Mm-hmm. So, so so you mentioned that one of the areas that's, that seems to be doing well now is uh, climate-based or environment-based things. Are there other particular types of technologies within the space industry that seem to be, I don't know, most pop, I don't know, popular is the right word, but that that are more likely to get investments or, or or maybe kind of recover from this and, and come out stronger? Yeah, I think uh, what we saw last year, and I think we might see again this year, are um, surprisingly space hardware. So normally VCs mm-hmm. kind of don't like 
hardware they're like the margins are too low in space the market is not large enough you know set like selling hardware for for satellites for example but investment in that was up a fair bit and i think you know okay. the changes in the supply chain with russia's invasion of ukraine there were quite a lot of russian suppliers mean that you know people there's this kind of realignment and people you know changing up shaking up the supply chain yeah. obviously um uh, there's a great graph doing the round of we're now on an exponential curve for for the number of satellites in orbit. Um, and that means I think people are starting to see like, okay, maybe the space market itself is large enough mm-hmm. to invest in it. And also a lot of these space hardware companies don't have enormous capital needs. They don't need to raise six rounds and, you know, a billion dollars of funding, you know, maybe two rounds, keep it under 20, 25 million to really start generating revenue. And that might be, we don't have, you know, huge strong evidence for that, but that might be pretty attractive to some investors. Mm, okay. uh, and then anything that's in product. So I mentioned climate, you know, carbon credits using space data, insure tech, you know, using space data. We're definitely seeing a lot more of that. And we're definitely going to see, I think that's an exploding sector, to be honest. Okay. <clears throat> so if there are listeners and maybe they're in, in space tech and they're going to be looking at funding at somewhere along the record, suppose they're early, an early stage startup. And they're sending out a pitch deck or, or making the initial contact. And you probably review a lot of pitches. What jumps out at you? What's kind of a differentiator that says, why well, I need to take, I need to look at this one in more detail. It's not just the run of the mill pitch. Um, so I think, I think the thing that really kind of jumps out to me is probably a really strong team. I think okay. that's, um, that's the thing that jumps out at the pitch deck. I think just jumping back to, you know, what, what do we want to see overall and what's the best way for you to get your message across? I think it might be helpful to know how VCs actually deal, deal with pitches coming in. Um, so it'll, it'll vary from ev- in every VC, but broadly speaking, your, your, your deck will probably be sent to the most junior person, in the team who will have lots to go through in a single week. And they will need to kind of do a yes, no, yes, no, very quickly, very quick digest on your okay. coming in. And then they'll need to go and take that to the senior investment team and summarize why they're going with you or not going with you and summarize the information quickly. So trying to make it easy to pass on the information they said that's important for you know someone to take it in and pass that on to the senior investment team. So really strong team, you know, have already had an exit, sold a startup or you know, like not an amazing exit, but, you know, good, learn some stuff, you know, they will, they'll want to know that they'll want to know how large the market is. They'll want to know, have you got customers already? They'll want to know why your technology is different and why it's better. They'll want to actually something that's really hard. And that's probably the biggest failing on a lot of decks is can they very quickly and easily summarize what it is you do a lot of pitch decks. It's just not really that obvious. I sell, mm-hmm. I make this, I sell it to these people. It is this kind of contract. Like that is really important information. Okay. Um, and then who the competitors are, because it gives you good insight to, okay, okay, I think I understand this product, but yes, I do, because I know what that competitor does de- definitely. So making it just really easy, 10 pages, like that should be your slide deck. Um, there's a strong argument that you shouldn't send a slide deck. Um, you should get a warm intro. If you can get a warm intro to a VC, do that because they'll probably be under pressure at the at the VC to um, take take a call with you. And then in that scenario, I probably wouldn't send the deck. But but in general, if you're having to cold call, just send the deck um, because your your website isn't going to have enough information, and that's the only other information people will have okay. available. Well, especially if there's some visuals you can sometimes, at least personally, scan things faster and kind of get the gist you of it. Scan things faster, but also you, you should be t- probably telling VC some stuff that you don't really put on your website because your competitors would see. Um, True. I mean, you know, don't don't mm-hmm. tell me, you know, who your contracts are, you know, and don't break any NDAs and something that you're sending as a cold call, but um, but definitely focus on your team. And I would nearly put that first if you've got a strong team. Okay. So to move just a tiny bit earlier in that whole process. Suppose there's a, a group of people thinking of launching a space tech startup today. What advice would you give them? Obviously build a good team and things. What what would you, if if you're on a, a founding member, a member of a founding team, what would you advise today? I would 
I would look at who you're planning to co-found with and see what skills gaps you're missing. So okay. I I I am a I'm an academic who has got lots of patents. I've realized this is this is my money earner. This is something I should spin out. Like what am I missing? Do I need to bring in someone who is more on entrepreneurial than me, who has business savvy, who's interested in contacts? Then then do that. So look at who your co-founders are, first of all. And then the second thing is, is talk to as many customers as possible. There are so many space companies who are you know, like, oh, I know I I, I come from a propulsion company. I know propulsion. I know what you should want. I'm going to give it to you. And then they just don't sell anything. You should talk to customers, design around what customers want. And this is something where space is probably at a fairly severe disadvantage in comparison to, let's say, a SaaS company. There's a lot of really easy things that SaaS companies can do to, to gauge customer interest um, and help design their product. They can do A-B testing. They can do landing pages. Sure. Um, which are not as open to you in space. On the other hand, it's a pretty small industry. It's pretty friendly. You can chat to customers. You can probably ring up Airbus and ask them, can I talk to you about my propulsion system, about my chip, about something yeah, like that. Sure. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so basically what's going to make or break your company is probably have you got the right product for customers? So talk to customers as much as possible and try and work out a way to get them to buy that, to demonstrate, you know, even in a small way to demonstrate to, to investors that there yeah. is real market demand. Yep. I think that probably works for just about every company out there. Also, <laughs> ask the customers first. Don't think you read their <laughs> minds. So what, so I'm, I'm sure you have, <clears throat> your job's interesting, a lot of different facets to it, facets to it. But well, what's the favorite part of your current work? What gets you most excited? Um, fundamentally, I really like meeting startup founders and then working with them long term after um, an, an investment. I mean, people are working on really interesting things and they're passionate about what they do. Um, and I'm an engineer and I love chatting to people about the really exciting things and ways they're going to shake up the industry mm -hmm. um and then working with them long term even you know in the bad times which you know 2022 probably more bad times than good to help work out how they can solve it and how they can develop a product and meet customers and, and things like that i mean you know it's it's really exciting um and i get to see what's going on across the industry mm -hmm. uh, yeah okay so what <clears throat> excuse me what do you there are a lot of challenges out there for the space industry what do you think are some of the biggest ones that that, that need to be addressed sooner rather than later um i think that there are a huge number of what i'm going to call space data companies so um typical examples earth observation constellations um People are imaging the earth in various different ways or doing remote sensing, and they're producing enormous amounts of data. Um, but are they, are, are, are commercial users in particular using that data as much as possible? Like, has that been transformed okay. into something that actually uses the data uh, and generates customers for the data, but actually then the ultimate customer is getting something useful out of mm -hmm. it. I think we're we're starting to see that. I, I mentioned the climate applications, the precision ag agriculture, carbon credits, but we need to have more and more and more of that to drive demand for that space data. Okay. So I, think, I think that's probably one of the largest challenges. Okay. That's yeah, making sense of vast amounts of data. <laughs> That's, that's making, sense, making sense of it and then turning it into i guess into the actionable insights in some way shape or form yeah okay very interesting so i have enjoyed talking with you today you shared a lot of great things what's uh what's ahead for you and your team for the rest of this year and maybe into next year um more and more investing um, so we are doing investments um, and so more investments within our existing portfolio, you know, scaling up our investment and then um, new investments. Um, 
two areas that I think are really interesting where I'm actively, you know, looking for startups are, um, I mentioned satellite to sell. So I'm trying to basically meet every company working on that and finding out what the best way is to do that and what's the, you know, what company has the highest potential there. So I'd love to make an investment in that. And then we're really interested in space bio, um, which is not astronaut health. It's using in particular microgravity research. So research on the ISS or in the new space stations or taking advantage of the microgravity environment to do uh, R&D related to pharma and life sciences. So I just think this is just my mind was blown when I heard about this concept. And actually it seems like it could be a really enormous market because obviously you're moving into life sciences. So in microgravity, things behave differently. Um, droplets form differently, proteins crystallize differently, uh, materials form differently. And that means that in practice, you can grow tissues um, in microgravity that would be, ter- they're, they're not performing, you know, stem cell research not performing on on the ground and it looks like we can get towards you know growing human organs in space that have full functionality um Mm -hmm. monoclonal antibodies which are for example in cancer treatment you can um change the drug delivery so they can be used um used in more applications um and it seems like there there are some companies looking at how you can manufacture gene therapy drugs much cheaper so gene therapy drugs mm. are like four million dollars a dose and you can radically reduce um the cost of manufacturing those so there's enormous mm. opportunities but it's obviously extremely challenging because space is high risk life sciences are high risk and matching them together trying to work out what option gives you the best risk return yeah um, for investment if they can get that figured out though the results could be amazing exactly exactly. and i guess that's the hard thing in dc because if they can get it figured out (laughs) but you know if they can get it figured out with this team on this time scale etc etc but yeah it's um certainly a really exciting opportunity okay well it's gonna be fun to watch i i love seeing all the technology there's you know new new things coming out every week new breakthroughs or new developments and it's exciting to see so it's exciting times compared to a few decades ago when it was slow (laughs) but well, I want to thank you. I love this discussion. Uh, you shared a lot of great information uh, for the listeners. I appreciate that. What if someone, a listener has questions or they'd like to get in touch with you or learn more about Seraphim Space? What's the best way for them to reach out? So you can certainly check out our website. It's uh, seraphim.vc or the best way to get in contact with me is probably on LinkedIn. I'm searchable mm-hmm. and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and okay. What we do a lot of at Seraphim was we have our own podcast series with different people from mm-hmm. the uh, the company and from our portfolio companies for kind of more uh, a, an introduction to some of the different aspects of space. And we also have a LinkedIn live series that we do pretty frequently as well, about kind of a deep dive on particular topics. I have watched some of those and they're good. I've watched one that you did. It was, okay, it was very great. good and, and informational and gave me some ideas on things to talk about in this interview. So it's a, that's a good resource. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, And I'll put uh, links in the show notes to both your LinkedIn profile, the website, um, as well as the report, the Q4 Space Index report that you mentioned earlier. So people can can go find that and see see what the numbers are from at least up through last year. So Perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks again for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. And this was very valuable. And I'll let you go and get on to all your fun work. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks.